During the 50s, in the wake of the Chinese occupation of Tibet, tens of thousands of Tibetans fled south to the neighboring country. On the periphery of the Nepalese capital, Kathmandu, they built new monasteries, like those which had once been characteristic for the entire Himalayan range. Early morning in one of the monasteries, the abbot instructs a Tibetan monk, Punso Lama, to travel to the legendary monastery of Samling, a journey which will take several months. For some years now, there have been rumors of art treasures disappearing from Samling. Punzo's task is to study the ancient writings and investigate the rumors. As an anthropologist, my purpose is to carry on my research there. We will meet then in Samling. The land of Bod refers to ancient Tibet. Bod, or Bu, as it is called in Punzo's language, was the native land of his forefathers, their history, and religion. And it was here that Punzo himself was born. Now ancient Tibet is coming closer, though still concealed behind chain upon chain of mountain peaks, the way dreams are hidden. Punzo has joined a small trading caravan. Today, very few merchants dare to embark on the several weeks journey across the Himalayas. In the region between the main range and the present day Chinese frontier, lie the remotest villages of Nepal. These villages are only accessible in summer by scaling passes over 16,000 feet high. They say the Tibetans there still live as they did centuries ago. At this time, I am already in Samling. After years, I was finally granted a research permit to travel through restricted territories along the Chinese border. The Bun religion, which is related to Buddhism, is still alive here. It is an age-old form of religious practice in which the spirits and demons of primeval times play an important part. The Samling Monastery complex is a spiritual center of the Bun religion. Its foremost intellectual figures have gathered here since time immemorial to debate the intricacies of their philosophy. It was here that some of the central sacred writings originated and religious works of art famed throughout Tibet. Punso will not be here for a few days. I'll wait for him, then we'll start studying the monastery's treasures. For me, Punso Lama, a refugee child from Kathmandu, this is my first real journey. It is the first time that I have ventured outside my familiar world in Kathmandu. I love the steady rhythm of walking. It's like meditating. That's another reason why my teacher sent me on this journey. In Kathmandu, you can't get away from the city. It prevents you from finding yourself. I am intent on practicing my powers of concentration and leaving daily life behind me.
Punso immediately goes to the local monastery in the first Tibetan village he passes. There used to be plenty of money around for the monasteries. Everybody chipped in to help finance them. The thinkers among the lamas have always been given the opportunity to free themselves from their earthly bonds and immerse themselves in meditation. They write books constructing elaborate philosophical systems. They never have to worry about earning their livelihood. At festivities, other lamas avail themselves of the same meditation techniques to invoke the favor of the local gods on behalf of the rural population. The lamas spend a great deal of time worshipping the mountain gods. The farmers ask them to for the sake of the crops. That's what they pay taxes to the monasteries for. The people depend on a functioning relationship with the mountain gods. Without their protection from demons and evil spirits, nothing here could survive. The crops would be destroyed by hail, and disease would wipe out the cattle herds. In the minds of the people, the mountains take on an almost human identity. They are either male or female. They can be benevolent, demanding, implacable, or angry. Unstinting veneration is the only way to ensure their lasting favor. Each village has its own mountain god. The villagers bring sacrifices and put on festivities for him. If the local god happens to be a warlike god, then the people feel obliged to prove to him that they are willing to fight themselves. Horseback races are held to remind the god of the once dreaded Tibetan mounted warriors, a memory that will please him. In early times, they appeased the mountain god with blood sacrifices. Music and dance are offered as a placatory gesture to the mountain god's wife. The men have to wait until the festivities are over before beginning with preparations for their annual journey to the Tibetan plateau beyond the frontier. 
Before they leave, the mistress of the house anoints the men and the animals with butter, butter as an ornament, white and precious as the gleaming snow which tops the sacred mountains. Although Chinese occupation forces put an end to cross-border trade, and thus profits are no longer a lure, the men set off each year, trading locally grown barley for Tibetan salt and Chinese industrial alcohol, as they have always done. Here it's not only financial considerations that count, but also the age-old love of traveling as a group, and the yearning for their Tibetan motherland. Punso's purchases are invariably a fiasco in business terms. Any woman with the slightest business sense can wrap him around her little finger. He passed the last shop, let alone market, a good fortnight ago. He has almost come to the end of the world. There's no electricity here, no sugar, not even rice. Punso has to purchase his provisions at a farm. He has left the trading caravan and will be on his own for the last two days of his journey to Samling. The Samling Monastery complex used to house a number of educated monks and their students. When I was there, there were just three left. The oldest had apparently freed himself from all earthly bonds, to use the Buddhist term. The second acts as village priest, and the third, the monastery's abbot, Sherap Tenzing, soon struck me as being a dubious character. Punso and I finally met up in Samling. Punso's teacher in Kathmandu had repeatedly spoken in glowing terms of the ancient meditation pictures in Samling. I have to explain to Punso that only 19 of the expected 400 pictures are left. The abbot claims that the pictures were stolen from him. We set about studying the remaining pictures. They either contain instructions for meditation techniques or they depict the lives of famous lamas. These tankas embody everything that constitutes the Bun religion. Something dramatic is happening in the village of Pichor, about two and a half hours downhill from the monastery. For months now, the mountain god has been afflicting the villagers with disease and death. <laughs> Madame, I am not a man, 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 I am not a man,
Everybody in the village knows the reason. The mountain god Muk Parong is incensed at what he sees, neglect of religious duties and the disappearance of the monastery's sacred treasures. Dawn until late that night, I sit with the villagers in the Gompa. <laughs> They implore the angry god to relent, begging him to spare them, invoking the covenant he concluded with them, and pledging to bring sacrifices. At some point, the intensity of their imprecations starts to take hold on me, too. I tell myself that the atmosphere is having a hypnotic effect. I am moved by the faces of the people as they beg to be spared death. I am no longer an observer, but a participant. Silently, I join in their prayers. I see is not the one I had read about in the ancient descriptions. This has mainly economic reasons. The life of the simple peasants in the village in the pastures has changed precious little over the centuries, but they can no longer rely on the profits from trade, which just two generations ago led these people far into Tibet. The monasteries used to receive their share of the profits. At that time, some of the wealthier traders owned flocks of sheep or herds of cattle which were larger than an entire village's livestock today. Inevitably, the traditional system of chindak, by which the wealthier section of the population sponsored intellectual and cultural life, has broken down. The abbot of Samling, Sherap Tenzing, has come up with his own solution to the problem, his own system of self-sponsorship. He pulls out a book to justify his actions. By citing the line of succession, he tries to vindicate his claim to ownership of the monastery's art treasures, 
which explains why so many have vanished. Clearly, thieves were not the only culprits. I feel somewhat disillusioned by Samling. The rumours have proven true. The abbot is doing a roaring trade in pictures and statues, objects which were entrusted to the monastery centuries ago and which mean a great deal to the villagers. crisis-ridden village of Pichor, with its inhabitants afflicted by a mysterious illness, an abbot who is bleeding his monastery to death by plundering its priceless treasures instead of promoting religion and teaching, and a mountain god who, incensed at the abbot's sacrilege, is inexorably taking his revenge on the villagers. A fascinating situation, especially for me as an anthropologist. On the other hand, we don't feel comfortable just observing it. As the summer was drawing to a close, Punzo told me about the Crystal Mountain, which we planned to circle along with the villagers on a pilgrimage. We circle everything which we hold to be sacred. When we circle a man-made shrine like a monastery, we are revering the body, the teachings, and the spirit of Buddha which are present in it. Far more important, though, are the natural holy places, Europeans find it difficult to recognize natural sacred sites. The Crystal Mountain, for instance, is for us the pillars of heaven. The Buddhists in this region regard the Crystal Mountain as the brother of Kailash, the holiest of all mountains for Hindus and Buddhists alike. For each devout Buddhist, it is one of the goals of life to circle the Crystal Mountain at least once before he dies. Every year, large numbers of pilgrims arrive at the full moon in the sixth month of the Tibetan calendar and pitch their tents around the monastery of She Gumpa. It was founded by the Lama who had first circled the Crystal Mountain. Every time we circle the mountain, it is beneficial to our reincarnation. So a pilgrimage is a way of enhancing our religious record. A life spent and trapped by earthly snares will always necessitate atonement later. You can collect karmic merit in advance. After all, you know that you're going to sin again. Every outcrop of rock here is inhabited by a god, and the water which gushes from every spring contains magic life forces. I didn't feel particularly excited at the thought of ice-cold life-giving water. I had enough to do contending with the extreme altitude of 20,000 feet. Although the Lama who was accompanying us assured me that once I had drunk the water, I would never have to worry about going to hell. Thank you. 
It's not actually necessary for a Lama to lead a pilgrimage. Each person must establish his or her own contact to the gods. The pilgrimage reminded me of one of the essential features of this religion. While we in the West tend to focus on sin and retribution, the people here regard a pilgrimage as an occasion for laughter and joy. It was a festival for the gods. The pilgrimage to the Crystal Mountain is the social event of the year. Despite the rugged terrain, people gather here from valleys near and far. It is especially joyous for the women many of whom never otherwise go beyond the confines of their own villages. For the old people, the festival with its dancing is a manifestation of divine veneration. The young people enthusiastically seize the opportunity of meeting members of the opposite sex from neighboring villages and winning their hearts. This has been the downfall of many a long-standing arranged engagement and even of marriages made for life. Hardly have we returned to the village and the gloom of peat shore envelops us again. Even Punzo seems affected by the somber mood. The village children find Punzo's way of washing clothes hilarious. Many have to mourn over a family member. In the devotion room on the roof of the house sits the village Lama. He accompanies the souls of the deceased through the underworld for 49 days and thus guides them to a more favorable reincarnation.
小娃子三千，你个九百年，千百层不老九那你们几个阿拉娘就。Over the last few months, the disease has spread to more and more houses in the village. The local doctor thinks the right way to treat what he refers to as a cold illness is by applying heat. When rainstorms and hail threaten to destroy the harvest, every pair of hands is vital. The disease has become a matter of life and death for the village as a whole. Even the shepherds are leaving their flocks on the pastures to spend weeks helping out in the barley fields. Another soul has departed the body and must now sever all links with it. The body must be disposed of. As with all other important decisions, astrological calculations are consulted. <laughs> The diagrams map out the time of birth and the signs of the zodiac. This enables us lamas to determine whether the corpse should be interred, burnt, buried in the open air, or thrown into the river. This body will receive an open air burial. Tomorrow morning, a distant relative will carry the corpse on his back to the burial site.
We have devised a plan for alleviating the plight of the villagers. It wasn't the immediate shock of individual deaths, but the imminent danger that Petro's livelihood was being eroded that made us ask ourselves whether the village had a future. Our fond vision of ancient Tibet had given way to a new idea. The centuries-old tradition of teaching at Samling Monastery had become extinct. There were no famous teachers left here to entice pupils. Samling would produce no more outstanding personalities. The only pupils left in the monastery were the sons of the abbot himself. We decided to take two children from other families in the village to Kathmandu. They would then return here to teach and set an example. And bring them down to Kathmandu. Yeah, you can do. What did you do? What did you do? Do you mean it? 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 Samasi do Ah, We later learn that eight-year-old Pema Dorce's parents separated years ago. His father is now living with another woman. His mother has also remarried and lives in another village. Nobody wants the half-starved boy. Pemadorce's father is visibly relieved to surrender responsibility for the child. As a farewell gesture, he unexpectedly blesses us with butter, like an affectionate father. Yeah, <laughs>
The second boy, Gurme, is 10 years old. His mother died two weeks ago. Since then, he has been living with relatives on the high pastures above the village. He has inevitably been assigned his place at the very bottom of the family hierarchy. While the other children are allowed to stay by the tents, he must do the chores that no one else wants to do. We explain our plan to Gurma's uncle. As soon as he realizes that Christian is willing to pay for the boy's education, he agrees. He understands that this will give the boy vast new opportunities. For a village lad, Going to a monastery earns him enormous prestige. Later, as an educated lama, his word will always carry great weight, both in religious and political matters. The uncle could never have offered Gurma such a chance in life. The Tibetans are curiously unsentimental about saying goodbye, even if it's to be for years or forever. Gurme's uncle is poor. All he can give the boy on his journey to a new life is a small bag of flour. When we reach the southernmost Tibetan village, we again look in on a family I had met on my upward journey. Uh, 
It is remarkable how fast the boys have grown to trust us. Pema Dorce has never before been allowed to eat as much samba as he wanted. Our hosts view us as a family unit, albeit an all-male one. Since we left, one sentence has kept going through my mind. When you inspire someone's confidence, you take on responsibility for him. As we surmount the last pass, we leave behind us a summer of insights. I had set off full of high expectations in quest of ancient Tibet in the isolation of the Himalayas in a valley which time had passed by. What I discovered was a lost land in quest of the present. Now we were carrying the responsibility for the village's future over the mountains toward the south. While we plodded along the endless path toward the valleys of the Tichu Rong, we expected the children to be full of questions and amazement. In their homeland, trees were a rarity. Here, whole forests make up a large part of the landscape. But the children seemed to take all the new sights for granted. We hoped that they might be able to resist the various temptations which awaited them in their new world. Gurme had never before seen an airplane. Pema, on the other hand, was wholly engrossed in devouring his first apple. 
The creation of airfields lends even the remotest provinces an artificial proximity to Kathmandu. It also cut our travel time from three weeks to three hours. What will become of the two? Will they be monks? Or merchants? Or scholars? Or will they just imitate an ancient Tibet for gullible tourists? We had taken two children and turned them into the pillars of a dream. On the way, the dream lost its importance and is now making way for a reality suffused with emotion. Punso did not need long to report on his original mission to the monastery of Samling. The abbot was not blind to the fact that Punso had exceeded his mission and authority by taking on responsibility for the lives of two children. They will have a great deal to talk about.
Come <laughs> on.